Once again, we're doing something a little different on the channel. And I make re relevance to the fact that people often ask me what to look for when they're purchasing a queue. Well, I like to think I know what a good queue looks like and what it feels like. But I'd like to go a little deeper than that. And I've come along to a very reputable queue making company in Nottinghamshire called Qcraft. Neil, can you just show me uh, what the first thing is you look for when you're selecting a piece of wood of course, to make Barry. a queue? My pleasure. Um, let me just grab a couple of pieces of ash. And what we're looking for is in a high quality queue. A nice straight grain. Can and I have a look myself? Of course. And if you look down those two shafts, you'll see this one's got a lovely straight grain and this one's a little bit wavy. So that will definitely become a snooker cue. Oh yeah, even to my novice eye, that's plainly obvious. This one's straight grain, this one's rather crooked. Yeah. So that would be used to make a good quality queue. Absolutely. Uh, and would this be discarded? Or oh, no, no. No, we never throw anything away, Barry. That would probably end up being a rest shaft. Lovely. So this would never be used to make a queue. It wouldn't no, be good enough for your... it's too wavy. Yeah, OK. So we'll put that to one side for now. And the next process is to shape yep, this into some you. sort of a queue. Yeah, I'll show you the next process. OK. Let's put that one back. Well, thanks a lot. No problem. Lovely. So Barry, we've chosen our ash shaft. Um, the next step is to choose a butt. So we've got rosewood or ebony. So if you would like to choose one of these beautiful woods. Can I feel them? Of course. Well, I know that the ebony is a very dense and heavy wood. Is, is this lighter in weight, the rosewood? Yep, naturally lighter than um, ebony. Um, obviously ebony is probably the, one of the densest woods in the world, hence why it creates the balance of I the queue. understand, yeah. So with this being lighter in weight, if I wanted a fairly heavy queue, would I have to add a, a, a metal weight at all? Yeah, if you were to choose a 19, 20 ounce queue, uh, naturally this queue would never come out at that weight. So we would have to add um, weight to that butt. I yes. see. But that's normally not necessary with the ebony? No, nope. with an ebony cube because again, because it's so naturally weighted, um, so. it's very rare we would have to add weight to it. Right. Well, I've already got a, an ebony butt on my cube, and as soon as you're making this one for me, uh, I think I'd like to choose the rosewood, please. Fantastic. Great, thank you. The next stage, uh, making this one-piece hand-spliced rosewood cube, is to turn the ash shaft uh, which we've done, as you can see, mm -hmm. and we need to add two flats ready to accept the rosewood wedges. Right. Um, as you can see, Ken is planing away to add one of the flats. Once he's created that side, he'll then add that one. Got you. From there, we will then glue four wedges, rosewood wedges, to the queue. Then they get planed again, ready to accept the next two. Yep. Got you. Um, we've already got one done to here so we've added the two wedges and we've planed this black to back to flat ready to accept the next two wedges either side mm. so it's interesting to note that the ash goes all the way to the end of the cube on a one-piece cube barry that's that's how it's created yeah. whether yeah. this is rosewood or ebony because some players will will obviously say that on a one-piece cube they get a different feel to a to a three-quarter butt joint yep. Yep. So it's interesting to note that on the one piece queue, this, this ash does go all the way to the end. It does. Thank you very much. So Barry, the next step in the process is to glue on the last two wedges um, to the prepared shaft that we've watched, just watched Ken finish. Mm -hmm. um, and to make it a little bit more interesting, we're going to add a veneer and an exotic wedge. So, if you'd like to choose a, a coloured veneer, Barry. Well, I've certainly got a wide selection, ranging from all sorts of colours, but as soon as our blue is my favourite, I'll choose that one. Okay, blue it is. 
And finally, if you just like to choose a wedge, as you can see, we've got a few exotic woods here. Um, this one here is Zebrano. Sorry, that one's Zebrano. Um, we've got some Coca-Bola, we've got some olive wood, but choose one of those wedges, Barry, and we'll add that as well. Well, I don't want to be too fancy, but equally I want it to look like my cue. So I've got a rosewood butt, the blue veneer, and probably something nice and light. Okay. How's that? Those yeah, you've chosen. To go together. Very nice. Yeah, very subtle. Thank you. It's a nice, <laughs> nice ash wedge. So the next process is to take the blue veneer and the ash wedge and glue these to the prepared shaft. So now we're getting to the final stages. What comes next? The next step is to plane the queue to the customer's dimensions and then take the queue to be ferruled. Uh, as you can see, we've got a brass ferrule and a stainless steel one. Which one would you like? Uh, well, I'm used to brass, so I'll stick with the brass if I may. Okay, Sean, can you fit the brass ferrule, please? And the idea of the brass ferrule is just to protect the cube, am I right? To protect the ash, yep, from all the impact. So the protruding piece of the wood, that will be taken off, I assume, to yep. facilitate the tip. Yep, they just literally slice that piece off and it's absolutely flush with the top of the ferrule. So now, as you can see, Barry, that is absolutely perfectly flush with the top of the queue, ready to accept the tip. Yeah, lovely. Um, I, I often get frustrated when I see uh, players that take a tip off and they start filing this ferrule to try and get a flat surface. This is already a machined flat surface. Yeah. There's no need to touch it no. ever again, is there? When that tip comes off or they want to replace the tip, all they need to do is ensure all the old glue's off and you don't need a file to do Great. that. Yeah, thanks a lot. So now we're at the sanding stage. Um, Sean is at the final stages of that, but we started with a coarse grit sandpaper. Then we go all the way down all the different stages to the super fine sandpaper that he's using now. And this is the last stage before we go to finishing the queue. Okay. The last step before finally polishing the queue is to bring the grain of the ash out. So Sean's adding now what we call a grain fill product and he'll just cover the whole shaft in the grain fill. So, so he's put the grain fill on, it, it looks awfully dark at this stage. What, what's the next process now? Yeah, so the grain fill's been on for the past 24 hours to dry and soak into the uh, queue. And basically Sean's now just taking the surplus grain fill off. And as you'll see, it will start to go lighter and lighter. And what you'll be left with is the figuring of the ash just brought out by this grain fill. So Barry, here we are, just uh, adding the mini butt joint to your new queue. Great. Um, not a lot to say, so let's just watch Ken fit that. Do, do all the manufacturers have their own type of joint? Yeah, all manufacturers have their own male and female joint for their queues. So how much of that threaded portion is going in about a couple of inches? And that will be nice and secure, I take it, yeah? And there it is, Lovely. finished mini butt joint and radius at the bottom. Here we are with the uh, final finished queue. Uh, as you can see, the butt joint's all in and polished, mm -hmm. um, ready to accept a little mini butt. The lads have just made solid rosewood mini butt that goes straight into the bottom of your queue. And there you are, Barry. That's One lovely. finished, hand spliced so this rosewood queue. This has gone through quite a, a number of polishing yep. procedures. Intense to get... polishing, top to bottom, numerous processes we use. Um, no varnish whatsoever, it's all oils. And that feels lovely, thank you very much. What would you recommend now for keeping it in, in this state, to be honest? Uh, it's quite simple really, Barry. Just the most important thing is storing it in a good quality case. Okay. And never lean it against a wall. Right. Never leave it in the boot of your car and never, 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 never leave it near a, a heat source. Okay. And, and that's it. should last you a very, very long time. A lot, a lot of people use a, a damp cloth because the cues do get grubby over a period of time. 
And one of your your fitters there was telling me all you need is a sheet of paper. Yeah, it's one of the little tips of the trade. Um, just get a piece of clean A4 paper, screw it up like a rag, and polish the cue with that piece of paper. And you'll see the grime appear on the white piece of paper and just keep doing it till the paper's clean. Lovely. And it brings it up as that is there. Thank you very much. I try it in the case. Yeah. So you recommend a good quality case to keep the cue in? Essential, Barry. Essential. Uh, this is a cue case we make ourselves. Um, and the main advantages to a quality case is the fact it traps the cue nice and tight so you know it's not going to rattle around okay. inside. So they are quite difficult to close when they're new. You can see that's all in there now, your cue, your mini button, your extension. Lovely. And that's not going yeah, anywhere great. inside. Yeah, lovely. I'm chuffed. Chuffed you well. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Don't forget, I see you've got a, quite an array of cues here, uh, ranging from quite expensive to relatively cheap. What, what, what are the attributes of a, of a good cue as opposed to uh, the, the cheaper variety? Well, there's four categories really within our range of cues. You've got hand spliced ebony cues. You've got machine spliced ebony cues. You can tell the machine spliced by the sharp points. Uh -huh. And then we've got a couple of hand spliced rosewood cues, as is yours. Yep. And then we've got a few machine spliced rosewood cues. Right. So they do vary you know, in price, as you said, quite dramatically. But what you're really paying for is A, ebony is very expensive itself. Yeah. Um, and then it's the intricacy of the detail within the butts. Right. So for example, this cue here is what we call tulip spliced. So the pattern goes all the way around yeah, yeah. against the one that we've just made for yourself that's just got the one wedge and a veneer on the front. So, so that would be very labour intensive. Very labour intensive. It takes a long time to create that one. Yeah. And that particular one has got more ebony in it. Yeah. Um, so it's far more naturally balanced. And the shaft itself is a very straight grain shaft. And aesthetically, you can see the perfectly spaced ash darts yes. running through those cues. Yep. So the, the main reason they are our premium range is the detail in the butt, the extra ebony, and the quality of the shaft. I see, I see. When you come down to these, these are still top-end hand-spliced cues, but there's less detail in the butt, and slightly less amount of ebony, and not as much perfection within the piece of ash. I understand. Yep. But they're still high-end quality cues uh -huh. for anybody to use and it's because it becomes a budget thing right. um, so, so yeah in your experience though I mean the fact that if we go back to the to the ash shaft we've got a very straight grain which obviously you've selected that wood yeah if we come to something that's got shall we say not quite so good as that yeah doesn't really affect the playing quality does it I would say no, Barry. It's, it really is an aesthetic thing. You know, some players do use the ash darts to sight. Yes. So they may be looking at the last couple of darts. I see. You know, we get requests where a customer may, doesn't want one at the very top of the shaft. Right. Um, so we obviously try our best to, to uh, make the cue for that customer. Right. Um, but yeah, from a playing point of view, no. Can, can I just mention that from a coaching point of view, uh, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the thickness of the book. Okay. Um, I like to be able to uh, make a nice circle with the front of my hand. Okay. I mean, this is nice slim butt here, but some manufacturers make them too thick. Okay. Do, do you do a variety of thickness? Yeah, again, we get lots of requests for different diameter butts. Um, you know, they can start at 31 mil and they may go down to 24, 25. So, Again, if the customer really knows what they want, we will do our absolute best to make that cue to their exact specification. Yeah. And you would possibly advise them in, in some form as well? We, we try our best, but yeah. you know, when the customer knows what they want, they really know what they want. Okay, that's fine. A lovely piece of wood, lovely cue. Here we are, Barry. Here is your cue that we've managed to make for you today uh, in a nice case. And I really hope you've enjoyed watching your cue being made today. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Clark. I've learned a lot about how a cue is made. I'm very impressed with the end result. Uh, your technicians do a wonderful job. 
And I think the main thing they've come across to me is how you select a nice piece of wood, how labour intensive it is to, well, particularly at the butt end, absolutely magic. I'll take this away with great pride and hopefully use it and see if we can make the odd century now. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Neil. My pleasure, Barry. Thanks.